quite clearly we're looking at a predator that would have gobbled up anything that came its way. The, the first effect it has on me is just like, wow, this seems bizarre. This would not be an animal you would want to run into in a dark alley. It's a fearsome animal with jaws so long and claws so big, it looks like it came from another planet. And it did. Planet Earth, some 100 million years ago. Paleontologist Paul Serino spends a good deal of his life looking for remnants of that lost planet. He has an amazing knack for finding them. At 40, Serino has made more significant discoveries than most paleontologists make in a lifetime. This expedition to Africa's Sahara Desert has been no different. One, two, three. In his first two months in the field, in temperatures often over 120 degrees, he and his team unearthed the titanic remains of a never-before-described sauropod dinosaur. Now, as the last of its massive bones are prepared for shipping back home, Serino sets his sights on finding something more. He's looking for an ancient predator, and he thinks he knows where to find it. From the desert town of Agadez in central Niger, the expedition pushes south, then east, deeper into the desert. With an armed escort as a precaution against bandits, they drive some 120 miles and millions of years back in time. Their destination is an extremely remote region where few people ever go and where the fossil beds are legendary. Go this way? Okay, go this way. A place known as Gadafawa. Look at the sand. I think that I think it would be a good place. I think we should put the big tent. Here, they will set up a base camp from which to prospect. So it'd be nice to have it by the bigger. Hey tent. Jeff, are you doing something important over there? Maybe? But within moments of arriving, nearly everyone in the crew is already finding fossils. Or is that a foot bone? It almost looks like a ornithopod foot bone. Nice too. Very nice too. With fossil bones scattered everywhere. Restraint is in short well, supply. I, I'd prefer to try and locate, look at this, it's unbelievable. I'd prefer to try and find Didier's site and then break up at that point. It would be nice to be able to find Didier's site. I, I, there's bone all over the place here, look at this. Look at there. I'll take it up and put it in my pocket. Oh, uh, maybe it's over there. Serino's first objective will be to return to sites that his French colleague, Didier Dutte, visited and marked on a scouting trip earlier in the year. Everybody go to prospecting. No, no, no. But it's hard to get anyone to focus on Didier's sites because it seems like they're finding dinosaur bones with every step they take. Oh, wow. This is a together. Tyrannosaurus, Maxilla. Oh, look at that thing. We've got Ronosaurus, we've wow. got Pterosaur, we've got a sauropod and a theropod. Five minutes. Beautiful bones. It's like they're working in some kind of bizarre dinosaur mega mall. The selection and variety of fossils is overwhelming. Yeah, this is a piece of uh, a rhinosaurus. And the prices aren't bad. Normally, paleontologists have to pay with sweat and dig for their finds. Here, many of the bones are simply right at the surface. We've got, wow, look at those ribs, beautiful. They've also found a pelvis, vertebrae, and lots of other bones that belong to a predator. They think it's some kind of spinosaur, a type of high-spined dinosaur known for its toothy jaws and massive claws. But unless they find some of those signature bones, they can't claim a major discovery, and so they just keep looking. Thank you. 
Then, on their fifth day, paleontologist Dave Verricchio makes an astonishing find. Wow, this is great, Dave. That's a big ass claw. This is a real It's almost a foot long, an ancient gaffing hook that's probably from the hand of the predator they've been hunting. Even more amazing, the claw isn't locked in stone. It isn't even buried. It's just sitting on the ground like some insignificant piece of paleo trash. Well, this, this is the thumb claw for a spinosaur dinosaur. So that's actually like the last bone of, the, of your first finger. So I had a really huge set of claws. And where there's a claw, they hope there'll be more critter. You know, a couple more finds like this, and maybe we can assemble the whole animal after a while. Now that they know they're on the trail of a spinosaur, they're dying to find the most telling part of the animal the skull. But this dinosaur megamall closes at dark. Attention, Bob Mark shoppers. The store is now closing. The team works long hours, not only because they love what they do, but because out here, there really isn't anything else to do. Popcorn appetizers coming up. The nearest Starbucks is more than 2,000 miles north of them in London. The nearest movie theater, a three-day drive. After nine weeks in the desert, popcorn is a real highlight. Oh, it smells good. You like with the cheese? You go for plain, you like with cheese? There are a few other diversions. Well, I know, but like some of them are like long and they're like tucked in there. I just want to get rid of these guys down at the bottom. How many days growth is that? Whole time. I don't know. Two months? Two Let's months. Talk, Two months. This is the weakest. Weeks or months. <laughs> 50, this, 50 days. This is the like weakest that. facial hair crew you've ever seen. <laughs> Though their lack of facial hair is troubling, spirits are surprisingly high. The frequent discoveries and relatively easy excavating make this location a bone hunter's Valhalla. And it just keeps getting better. The day after Dave discovered the claw, Hans Larsen makes another remarkable find. Sweet. It's the jaw of the Spinosaur. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, the whole thing's about this big. It's nice. When I first saw it, I figured, no way, that this, this can't be a Spinosaur, because like, like, we don't know of, of, a, of a good Spinosaur skull ever in the world. And so, so I was like walking around trying to find ways to say, well, it's not a Spinosaur, it's just like a, like a funky piece of crocodile. Funky because up to this point, paleontologists knew that spinosaurs had long snouts. But the piece of snout bone they found is over two feet long and extremely narrow. It's their first clue that this may be an entirely new kind of spinosaur. Pretty cool. Let's dig it up. Pretty unbelievable. <laughs> it's about time. How many crocodiles in this thing looks just like this? Get in there. These are the kinds of discoveries that um, we were hoping to make. Um, to get, you know, really good material, articulated material, yeah. cranial parts of the skull, parts of the skull of the, of the new dinosaurs in this area, because any, any skull that we find would, would, would be a big contribution. So it's, a, it's really a tremendous discovery. Before they can excavate their prizes, the inhospitable Sahara gets a little meaner. How's your tent, John? With only a week left in the field season and over four tons of bones to remove, they can't stop working even at the risk of being sandblasted. The weather conditions were horrible. But if you can imagine a windstorm with like sand in the air and then, and then your eyes open, just like, like sand just like pelting your body 24 hours a day, that, that, that's exactly what it was like over there. So it, it's, it's uh, tough, really tough. The sand blows everywhere, like a fine, gritty mist. It's even worked its way into the National Geographic camera, where it wreaks havoc on the pictures. For the Sereno team, the blowing sand makes an already tedious task more difficult. After each bone is chiseled out of the rock, it still has to be covered with a protective layer of plaster for shipping. Not everyone is cut out for such work. Who, other than a paleontologist, would toil 10 hours a day at hard labor in a sandstorm with a bag on their head? That's to make me think that this is fun. 
To cut down on sand in their diet, lunch is served inside the cafe <laughs> Land Rover. Nice atmosphere, but they're running out of time. A week later, with the bones packed up and the skies clear, they're on the road home. It has been a remarkable expedition. They now have the most complete skeleton of a predator from this period ever found in Africa. Though they managed to excavate nearly every bone they needed, they're leaving Niger with only a dim sense of what this new type of Spinosaurus really looked like. That will change here, in a basement laboratory at the University of Chicago where the animal will get back on its feet for the first time in 100 million years. But first, the bones must run a gauntlet of drill and pick-wielding students. Over the course of the next four months, each of the hundreds of pieces of bone will be painstakingly cleaned in what can only be described as a dental hygienist's nightmare. We're uh, still unveiling bones each day, and we're in the process of unwrapping our Christmas presents. We're going to take those bones, we're going to make replicas of them. Uh, at the same time we're doing that, of course, we're working on the science. We're putting it together, we're measuring it, we're reconstructing it, first in two dimensions. But once we get those replicas, we'll begin to assemble it in three dimensions as a skeleton. As they do, they'll confront a predator with remarkably powerful forelimbs and a frightening complement of tools for killing prey. Its thumb, like most of the predatory dinosaurs, uh, would have been semi-opposable. We haven't prepared out, but we do have the first uh, uh, finger, and it shows that this would have been sitting at an angle to the other digits, and it would have helped the animal grasp in that fashion. Now, uh, this would have continued in life with a horny sheath out to about here. You would have been dealing with a, an enormous sickle-shaped claw that, when it closed and clamped, would have grasped something pretty firmly. This would not be a nice animal to run into in a dark alley. Still has to bring that big, nasty claw back to life, Paul is working with sculptor and paleontologist Stephen Cherkis. I mean, this, this, if anything, is remarkably conservative. In actuality, it could be just mm -hmm. grossly beyond this in length. Yeah. Uh, Most paleontologists so think modern birds descended from predatory really dinosaurs, so they animals. use the claws of modern birds as a guide to what this claw might have looked like. Do you keep uh, bird's feet around? Doesn't everyone? Yeah. They're just remarkably similar and, and very valuable. Yeah, I, I have a, uh, an emu, a dried emu foot up in the... Uh, While birds provide a model for the claw, the, the snout and good. skull of the animal break the mold. They've never seen anything quite like it. I mean, the most impressive thing about this is that uh, the skull is maybe uh, 8 inches, 10 inches high. Uh, and uh, almost a, a meter long in the snout. And there's no dinosaur with this proportion. There's no dinosaur that comes close. Um, this is absolutely exciting. And that's so unique. And in addition to length, the, the front and of the jaw so is loaded with and a frightening array of large teeth that form a kind of hook. And that hook at the end is sort of expanded like a little oval pod of especially long and recurved teeth. That's why we think it was eating fish. The jaw is surprisingly reminiscent of a modern fish eater. The gharial, a kind of crocodilian which today is found only on the Indian subcontinent. Gharials can grow to over 20 feet, have lightning quick jaws, and are tenacious hunters. But now imagine an animal 14 feet longer, something that stands 11 feet tall and wields a set of eviscerating claws. It makes the gharial seem about as threatening as a French poodle. I, I'm still trying to imagine it because um, no one's uh, three-dimensionally reconstructed a skull with these proportions on a dinosaur. It's going to look like a, 
I don't know, a terrific bipedal crocodile or something. It's probably not far. Paul has decided to include the crocodile idea in the official name for this dinosaur, Suchomimus tenarensis, which means crocodile mimic from the Tenair Desert. If the name doesn't exactly make you quake in your boots, perhaps the various reconstructions of Suchomimus will. I, I would like, I think, to see this animal down low, up front, snaking, sort of as if it were almost fishing, with its hands, you know, with the claws ready to grab something, just like you say, mm -hmm. to some extent, interacting with something, it's, it's looking, it's, re it's, it's ready to go after something. Almost like a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> you read about this being visually striking at the public that would be actually looking at a life-size version of this. I think even small kids would for a second wonder if they were going to be the next meal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Striking fear into the hearts of children is only part of the objective of reconstructing the bones. It also makes the science come alive. You understand the animal or you have a scientific conception of it, but that really doesn't translate into an understanding uh, that this is actually a 35-foot-long predator with heavy arms and a very narrow skull until you brought it back to life in the way of a skeleton. To bring the skeleton back to life, Paul relies on a group of Canadian craftsmen and artists here in East Cooley, Alberta. Guided by a kind of master bone builder named Gilles Denis, they have taken the cast bones from Paul and begun the process of recreating the skeleton in life size. Though Paul's been working on the dinosaur for almost 11 months, this will be the first time he's ever seen it standing. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty large once you got it all together. Uh, These fantastic. arms are just such a, they're really monstrous. Yeah. Oh, that is a beautiful painting. People are going to be struck by the bizarreness of the skeleton. It's not like reconstructing any other dinosaur. It's the first of this kind that's reconstructed, and I think it, it, it's special for that reason. The skull is exactly four feet. Yeah. The capstone for this terrifying pile of bones is the head, a four-foot-long killing tool. And these things, in, to proper articulation, need to be like that. For Paul, measuring the gape of the mouth is a peculiar sort of culmination to a year of work, which started thousands of miles and millions of years from here. Okay, up a little bit, and dip we're about there, yeah. You are an investigator at a death scene, you've got footprints and fingerprints and bones, and, uh, and you need to reconstruct from that. And so we can get actually a good image of what the dinosaur looked like, but some aspects of its behavior and its color will forever be lost in the sand. Minimizing that loss is the domain of the sculptor. Over the course of several weeks, partly based on science and partly based on imagination, Suchomimus comes back to life. It's like night and day compared to imagining it on a piece of paper. There is the whole of the science behind it, but that's not the animal. And this is the animal, this is the reality.